Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live session of the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science webinar series. We have a very special guest with us tonight, my friend, Dr. Nathan Lentz. Um, he's going to talk to us about how we humans like to think of ourselves as highly evolved creatures. But if we are supposedly evolution's greatest creation, why do we have such bad knees? Why do we catch head cold so often, 200 times more often than a dog does? And how come our wrists have so many useless bones? Why is the vast majority of our genetic code pointless? And are we really supposed to swallow and breathe through the same narrow tube? Surely there's been some kind of mistake. Well, Dr. Nathan Lentz is an American scientist, author, and university professor. He's been on the faculty of John Jay College since 2006, and is currently the director of their honors program and the Campus Macaulay Honors College program. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Lentz is noted for his work in cell bio, genetics, and forensic science, as well as his popular science writing and blogging on the evolution of human behavior and biology. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Lentz. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for the invitation. So I, I'm going to let people know that to please, if they have questions, there is an ask a question uh, section here along the bottom of the screen. And I will be also minding your chat rooms. So if you ask questions there, I'll also, uh, I could ask those. And I have put the link to Dr. Uh, Lentz's book in the chat as well. So it's all, all yours. Okay, great. Um, and now I need to uh, share my screen, correct? That's correct. Okay, so this is a different platform than I'm used to. So a couple of steps and then I'm gonna make sure that you, and I, I can hear you, right? Yep, <laughs> Once I'm we not get going, going anywhere. Okay. Once we get going, um, and I'm going to do just the PowerPoint, I think. And I think you should be able to still see. Can you see that? Yep, uh, okay. we see that. That's it. Perfect. Now I'm now on full screen. Can you still see my face? I uh, we can have you I mean, large like you. this, or I can make you smaller. All right, I'm gonna go ahead. You, we see you in the corner now. Okay, I I can't see myself, but I don't care about that. I'll just uh, I'll just move ahead. You, but you can see everything just fine. The the screen. Yeah, I see the orange book cover, and okay. uh, we're ready to go. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for the invitation uh, to come and speak to you tonight about human evolution. Um, <clears throat> it, is, um, it is true that I wrote a book called Human Errors, which was all to do with uh, human flaws and imperfections. And um, sort of the joke of this book was that I wrote my first book on um, comparative human and animal behavior. And I'm, uh, I blog a lot about evolution and the evolution of, of human behavior, but it's not never been a research interest of mine. I'm not a psychologist. Um, and nor an animal behaviorist actually. And so my mother, after I wrote my first book, or as I was writing my first book, she, she didn't understand how I could you know, write a book about something that I don't do research on. And then when she found out I was writing my second book all about human flaws, that made a lot more sense to her. She's like, finally, something you know a lot about. Um, so uh, that, that was sort of the segue into the, into the second book was that um, we are a very flawed species. Um, and the, 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 there's several sort of theses or themes of this book. Um, most of which are surprising to a lot of casual readers, which is why um, I thought the book was worthwhile to write. Um, the one thing I'll say is that I think um, human beings are actually probably the most flawed creature, certainly the most flawed mammal, uh, maybe the most flawed vertebrate. And a lot of people sort of, you know, are surprised by that. They would think that that humans are as perfected as any other species. Um, and and really, the theme of the book is that. First of all, there's no such thing as perfection, but more importantly, um, humans have more flaws than most animals precisely because we're so good at navigating around our flaws and compensating for them. And one example I used to used to give about why humans, um, one way that humans get around this is that um, I used to have very, very poor vision. My, my distance vision uh, was 2425, something like that. My uh, I forget what my prescription was, but I had very, very thick glasses and now I don't anymore. I, I, my eyes work just fine. Um, and my biology didn't change. I paid someone to shoot lasers into my eyes and fix them. And, uh, and in fact, I used the advance from a book all about human flaws to fix one of my flaws. Um, and, and that's actually a, a perfect example of how we have um, evolved our way around our flaws using our brains. In this case, it was the brain of a physician. It was somebody else's brain. Um, but we, we were in a cultural exchange. Uh, and that's really the theme of the book is that humans 
um, have that cultural exchange with each other. None of us has to be perfect because we all rely on each other. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm pretty glad that I don't live and die based on how good my body works. Um, so that's, that, and, and most animals do, right? A, 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 except for humans. So um, I think it's a great tool for teaching. And, and this is the version of my book talk that I do give to teachers uh, and students um, talking about evolution because there are some very specific lessons about evolution that you can learn by studying imperfection. One of them is the idea, it, it, it gives you the chance to push back against a very pervasive idea uh, in, in among biology students and even biologists that organisms are perfectly adapted for their environment. And you'll see this a lot um, in textbooks. And, and a lot of people, even scientists, um, you know, on a multiple choice test, they might not get, they might not choose that choice. They might not get that answer wrong. But the bias that organisms are perfectly adapted for how they live really is pervasive in our thinking. Um, and so uh, the idea is, well, if, if, if an animal has that certain structure or does that certain thing, it must do something or evolution would have, would have fixed that by now. Um, and that's just not true, actually. Evolution is very sloppy. A lot of things are in evolution's blind spot. Um, and a lot of, um, of how we evolve our trade-offs and compromises. Um, and so you have to dig a little bit deeper before you, um, before you can make sense of all that. Um, another another uh, lesson that's important uh, that comes out of this book is that um, another bias that humans have is that we are the pinnacle of creation or evolution, however you look at it. That we're the sort of the apex and the history of life on earth has been this sort of steady march toward an ever more perfect form until humans arrived, homo sapiens, masters of the planet. Um, and, and really nothing could be further from the truth uh, in terms of biology. We do have some very, very special skills um, in which we exceed all of the other animals. Those are all cognitive skills. Um, and our social structure, which flows from those cognitive skills, is unique. Um, but basically everything else about us operates under the same principles as everything else uh, that walks the earth. Um, and, and in fact, as I've argued, and as I will argue, we, if you subtract uh, the prefrontal cortex from our biology, everything else about us is actually even more sloppy uh, because uh, we have taken the pressure off of our bodies uh, for so many millions of years. Uh, I gave the example of, of me paying a physician to, to shoot lasers in my eyes, and that's a new technology, but we have been using technology and we have been using sociality um, to compensate for imperfection for a very, very long time. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, when I say long time, I mean millions of years. We've been um, sort of taking the pressure off of our body and instead using our brains. <clears throat> um, another interesting lesson that comes out of uh, learning about imperfection um, is it teaches you about the limits of evolution and how evolution can operate with the body as it exists in that moment of time through tweaks and tugs only, and random tweaks and tugs at that. And so if you could imagine a human being growing wings and, and, and subsequently the ability to fly, obviously that would have enormous advantages. Why don't we have wings? Why don't more lineages have wings? Um, wings have, have open up all kinds of potential. But actually what we know is that if you look at vertebrates only, um, wings have only been invented three times uh, successfully in long term over long term lineages, three times among vertebrates, the birds, the mammals, the, the flying mammals and the pterosaurs, which, of course, have all gone extinct. So there's really only two clades now, the mammals and birds, flying, flying mammals and birds um, that have figured out um, how to fly. Um, why not? Well, because in order to get to the point where you have fully functional wings, you have to sacrifice a whole lot of other functionality, right? It would be great if new wings just sprouted out of our back, but there's no advantage along the way, right? You, you wouldn't have any natural selective advantage until the wings were already fully formed. There's just no way to get there. As the old saying is, there's no way to get there from here. So the only way that you can adapt wings, and this has happened the three times in vertebrates, is to co-opt the forelimbs. So birds lost everything else that they used to do with their front limbs. Uh, so they cannot grasp very well, for example. Uh, and there's other lost functionality there as well. So it's actually the evolution of wings is a highly improbable event because of everything that's lost. And in fact, we know that among several lineages of birds no longer fly. Uh, so they've evolved out of their way uh, of flying because flying had come at such great costs. Um, and the other thing is that 
uh, when you study human imperfection, you can learn a lot about how our ancestors lived. So I often say the body is, you know, one way to retrace uh, our ancestry is through fossils and, and, and so forth. But another way is to look at our body as it exists right now. And, um, and you can see how we used to live. You can get little lessons about our ancestral past. And once you sort of make peace with that past and make peace with the limitations of our body, you can live in better harmony with your body. Um, and in fact, uh, you can learn important lessons on how to live in a sort of more evolutionarily correct way. Uh, and in fact, a whole field has sprouted from this called evolutionary medicine, uh, which talks about diet, medicines, uh, how, posture, how you use your body day to day, how you sleep, how you eat, um, and try to sort of recapitulate uh, the ancestral past in some of those habits and see if, if it's uh, helpful. Uh, several very important insights have come from this. And one of them, which gets a lot of press um, right now, is a low carbohydrate diet. Many of you who are, who are older, who are my, maybe my age and older, will remember that there have been waves of, of uh, fad diets, basically. Low fat diet uh, was really big in the 80s. Fat was, was the enemy. Uh, now we know, of course, that fat's not the enemy at all. It's carbs. What, what was that? And dietitians were, were, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day and try to minimize fats and all of this. We now know that actually you don't need breakfast. You don't need to eat early in the morning. You don't even need to eat three meals a day, two meals a day. One meal a day is perfectly fine. Um, and in fact, probably better. Uh, and uh, low or, 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 or no sugar uh, is better. And that insight didn't come from the study of dietetics. It came from the study of evolution. As more and it became more and more clear to those who, to anthropologists who study our history, that we didn't eat at all like we eat now. And in fact, carbohydrates formed a very small part of our diet for, mer for millions of years. And it really wasn't until the invention of farming that we, we got to our current state where 75% of the world's calories um, are consumed uh, as carbohydrates. And that's just not how we're built. Um, and in fact, if you look at all the cuisines and cultures around the world, the staple food in the diet is always a carbohydrate of some kind, whether it's rice or wheat or millet or whatever it is, it's always a high carb because that's what farming allowed. Uh, but that's not the way that uh, we should be eating. OK, so the, my book is organized into a series of chapters. Uh, but before I talk about the themes of each chapter, I want to talk about the three sort of categories of human errors, how you can sort of classify each of the little uh, quirks. And I, I, we'll get to some examples soon enough. Um, one of them was what we call mismatch. And I was just hinting at this with the carbohydrate based diet. But there's lots of ways in which we use our bodies not in the way that they were intended to be used. And intended uh, implies um, you know, a creation event, which is not what I mean. But the way that our, the forces that shaped our body have now been turned on their head. And um, I, I suspect that many of you right now are watching this webinar in what I call an evolutionarily incorrect posture. You're sitting in a chair. Um, and I hate to tell you this, I know they're comfortable, but chairs are just no good for us. <laughs> you really are better off minimizing the time that you spend in a chair. To be honest, you probably shouldn't be wearing shoes as much as we do. Um, that actually a lot of the, the comforts that we have in our way of life um, has actually created a lot of weaknesses in our bodies and sometimes it's hard to reverse. I myself am standing right now and I do a lot of what I can to stand throughout the day, at least while I'm working. When I'm resting, it's different, um, but I do try to get out of my chair as much as possible, both at work and at home. And I haven't had back pain in about three years and I used to have quite a weak lower back. So I recommend trying to get out of your chairs as much as possible. Um, so it's big with diet, but, but with other things, we're just not using our bodies in the way that they were intended to be used. Um, there are also categories of errors that I call trade-offs. And this is where I was talking about the wings before, but there's lots of other examples where um, evolutionary forces of, uh, leading to fitness and, and adaptation um, were pressing on something that, that couldn't give. And so some compromise was reached. One example, is our, the shape of our back, which causes a lot of problems. Where if you look at the other apes and you look at our ancestors in our deep past, who before they started walking on four limbs, or on two limbs, excuse me, and they were mostly ambling about in the trees, um, or I'm sorry, swinging from the trees or ambling on four legs, uh, you'll notice that their backbone has a J shape with a very soft slope to it, but it has basically an upside down J shape to it. That's how a chimpanzee uh, vertebral column looks, a gorilla, uh, they have a J shape to it. Well, in order for us to stand upright, we had to straighten that. But simply straightening it, straightening it wasn't an option. 
uh, for a variety of reasons. For one thing, you, you lose the ability to hang, <laughs> which is what we do, uh, our internal organs. It's not, it's not as easy to hang them to a uh, single chassis in the back. It'd be great to run a rod right through the middle of the body, but that's not an option either. Uh, so, so instead of unstraightening uh, the curve at the top, what we did is we had a second curve, which I can't make that shape with my hand, uh, so that we have an S-shaped spine, sometimes called a sigmoidal uh, spine, uh, spinal column. So we, we have an S shape. That's how we stood upright. That was the trade-off, but that causes a lot of problems because now instead of having just one weak point at the top, we have a second weak point at the bottom, which is an even sharper curve, and that's where we get our slipped discs because the forces in a curved um, are born by that curve shape to it. Um, uh, are it's just not built to withstand that pressure. And a slip disc is what happens when uh, the little discs of, uh, of uh, cartilage slip out of place uh, in between the uh, bones, the vertebrae. And when that happens, uh, it's called a herniated disc. They're very painful. Uh, that is unheard of in the other apes. Uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, this is not an injury that our, our uh, close relatives ever deal with. It's, it's purely a result of the trade-off of our back when we begin to walk upright. Uh, we have similar uh, trade-offs in our knees and our ankles um, that create weak points. Um, one way I, I put it in the book is that we basically never completed the evolution of bipedalism. Bipedalism, um, walking on two legs, we made that uh, transition very, very quickly in our ancestral past, very, very quickly. If you look at the fossil record, you have you know fully arboreal species and fully terrestrial or partially terrestrial species that while still tied to the forest, we're definitely walking on two legs. It was almost in a blink of an eye. And anything you do quickly, you don't do well. And evolution is a, is a, it's a perfect example of that. So that quick evolution to upright walking left several weak points that we just never really fixed. Now, the third category of errors that I cover in my book is just purely bad luck. Uh, it wasn't a compromise. There wasn't anything gained. Um, it's not that we're using our body in a weird way. It's just bad luck and bad luck happens. And if it gets fixed in a population through a process we call genetic drift, there's no way to unfix it. The best example of this, the one that people are most familiar with, and I do write about this in the book. This was well known before my book, but for some reason people quote my book as if I was the one who first described it. But uh, one of, uh, example of bad luck for us is our need for vitamin C. So we have a dietary need for vitamin C, ascorbic acid. We can't uh, make collagen without it. Vitamin C does a few other things too, but that's really the key problem with vitamin C deficiency is we, we lose the ability to make collagen. And if you don't make collagen, um, essentially your tissues lose all their integrity and you fall apart, you bleed out of all of your orises. It's a condition called scurvy, as you'll probably remember. So vitamin C is important. However, most animals, don't need vitamin C in their diet at all. And if you, those of you with pets, dogs and cats, you don't need to make sure they get enough citrus fruit, do you? And if you look at their dog food, they won't have any fruit in it at all. It's generally just meat and rice and sometimes a little bit of supplementation, but not a vitamin C. Dogs and cats have no need for vitamin C. So does it, how do they do it? Why don't, why don't they die of scurvy? Um, well, they don't, they do just fine. It's because they make vitamin C for themselves. Ascorbic acid does all the same things in a dog and a cat that it does in a human, um, but they just make it themselves. So it's not really a vitamin, at least not a dietary vitamin for them, even though it is an important cofactor. So what gives? Well, there's a gene, there's several genes that are necessary to make this. Uh, and they make it in their liver, by the way. That's the tissue that mammals make uh, vitamin C in. Interestingly, um, uh, fish make it in their in their uh, kidney that what what their version of their kidney for some somehow that uh, functionality moved to the liver not so important but it's an interesting process there anyway it, it, most animals terrestrial mammals uh, terrestrial animals excuse me uh, make vitamin C in their liver we don't why not well one of the genes in fact the key gene um, the, the the final step uh, in the synthesis of ascorbic acid is called it's a gene that codes for l gulanolactone oxidase. Uh, GULO is the name of that gene for short. Well, that gene, we have it. We actually do have the GULO gene, but it's broken. It's broken through mutation. And it was broken a very long time ago. So we share this need for vitamin C uh, with almost all primates. Um, if you go, so, so lemurs, so the uh, uh, prosimians don't uh, have this broken gene, but all primates, all eight, or uh, all other primates, including old world monkeys, new world monkeys, and apes, um, need vitamin C in their diet because the gene to make vitamin C was broken through mutation. 
Now, it's not just broken a little bit. It's been littered with mutations ever since then because we're talking about an event that happened 50 or 60 million years ago. So it's continued to mutate unfettered by natural selection. Um, well, you might be wondering, well, why didn't the first ancestor animal, ancestor of all these primates who got this mutation, why didn't she die of scurvy? You know, if she, she can't make vitamin C, believe it or not, I mean, you gotta remember it would have been her mother who had the uh, mutation and she, because the only mutations that happen in eggs or sperm are passed on. So the irony of mutation is that any mutation that you suffer from, you don't pass on. And any mutation that, um, you, that you do pass on, you usually don't have any effects from because they only uh, affect your gonads uh, and specifically the germ cells. Anyway, the point is she didn't get scurvy and she didn't die. Why? She must have already had vitamin C in her diet. So she must have lived somewhere where vitamin C is found naturally. Where is vitamin C found naturally? Tropical rainforest, among other places. And so primates have been restricted. Uh, so and this is the bad luck. Uh, you might ask, well, okay, it didn't harm her, but it didn't help her either. How did it become so fixed in the population? And that's the bad luck. Mutation, okay, that was bad luck, but mutations are always happening. Natural selection clears them uh, if, they're, if they're negative, right? But in this case, it didn't. And through just sheer bad luck, she became the ancestor of the mighty clade that we know of as primates, uh, most primates. And... Um, it got fixed and that's called genetic drift, just bad luck, nothing gained, there's no upside, we just now need vitamin C. But this has restricted where primates can live ever since. So for 50 million years, primates have been restricted to climates to climates where vitamin C is found naturally and they got scurvy anytime they tried to migrate out of that. Uh, and for example, uh, the, con the entire continent of Europe was never successfully colonized by primates until humans, first uh, Neanderthal and, and some of uh, uh, recent, very recent ancestors, and then Neanderthals and then modern humans. And they, we almost certainly suffered scurvy when we did. But by that point, we had learned to bring some food with us. We weren't quite farming yet, of course, but we were uh, starting to manipulate our own diets a little bit. And so we had figured out foods um, that can uh, uh, not give us scurvy. We didn't know why, of course, but we, we knew what to eat and what not to. So that's an example of bad luck. Um, I, I don't organize the chapter, the book into those three chapters. The way that the chapters are organized in the book are as follows. So I go through anatomy and I'll give you at least one uh, new example of anatomy uh, that, I, that I mentioned in the book where there's some errors there. I also, oh, and so before I go through the chapters, I'll just give you some examples as I go. I'm going to have to pick up the pace a little bit here because I want to make sure I'm done by 845 and leave time for questions. Okay, anatomy. Um, so usually I ask this question to a live audience. Has anyone in the room ever had a cold? Uh, usually if there's at least 30 or 40 of you, you can get one or two hands up there. Um, obviously I'm kidding. Americans get between three and four colds a year. If you have children, it's like three or 400 a year. Um, so common cold is one, one of the most common ailments that we have. Um, and this is a fairly unique thing to human beings, actually. The uh, rhinitis and, and, and other, because uh, uh, it's actually a collection of, of syndromes, right? Um, this is not something that the other primates deal with very much. Um, some, some of our farm animals do uh, with some of these things, and that's because they live on top of each other the way that we do. But the other primates don't seem to get this. And one of the, one of the reasons why is that we have some funny anatomy in our sinus cavity. So if you look at the uh, inside the bones of the face, of the head, uh, we have some empty chambers in which um, um, that, that air doesn't really flow through very much. They're really just cavities. And the largest of those cavities are called the frontal sinuses. Um, and I'm sorry, the maxillary sinuses, the frontal sinuses are up here. Uh, can you see my cursor, Bertha? I don't know. Okay, well, I'll, I'll point with it, assuming- Sorry, I, I had muted myself. Um, go ahead and move your cursor around. Okay, you can see it? No, I do not see your cursor. Oh, okay, never mind. Well, the uh, frontal sinuses are in the forehead. The maxillary sinuses, which are sort of in the center of this picture here, are right behind your cheekbones. And the, um, they're the largest chambers, largest sinus chambers. These, these actually have no function whatsoever in humans. In fact, I'm in a, writing an article right now uh, with, a, with a bunch of doctors because I wanted to have a lot of, uh, you know, some ENT surgeons and so forth, a lot of, a lot of backup on this, this uh, hypothesis. But my hypothesis is that the uh, nasal cavities don't do anything at all. These sinuses are purely uh, vestigial structures that do more harm than good. Well, anyway, we have this... Um, 
this chamber, the uh, maxillary sinuses in our cheeks, and it's a big open chamber, and it is filled with mucous membranes, and mucus is produced and then drains. And this is the idea is, of course, to catch um, any invaders that would come, and, and they're basically just mucus factories. Well, the weird thing about it is that the drainage pipe, the drainage hole where all this mucus collects and then, and then uh, is directed down to the nasopharynx and eventually swallowed, um, is at the top of the chamber. And you have to ask yourself, what sort of plumber puts the drain at the top of a chamber rather than at the bottom? And what that does is it forces us to work very hard to move the mucus upwards. And you do that with cilia. Uh, and most of the time, it's fine. Most of the time, it's fine. And in fact, you can every now and then you need to clear your throat a little bit. <clears throat> That's that constant drainage of mucus from your nasal sinuses into your nasopharynx. You get a good swallow and you send it down to your stomach where it's safe and you can neutralize all the bacteria. Great. But why do you have them in the first place? Well, the reason we have nasal sinus cavities at all is because our ancestors did. And if you go back in time, mammals, the vast majority of mammals are snouted. So they have, their nasal cavities are out here in a snout and they have very large uh, sinuses there. And that reveals the real purpose of the nasal cavity. It's for olfaction, it's for smell, because most mammals actually navigate the world through their sense of smell. So they pack in millions upon millions upon millions of olfactory receptors in their snout. And like, I don't know if you know this, but your dog uh, recognizes you by your smell much more than by how you look. Uh, you can't FaceTime or Skype with, uh, with your dog. Um, but they can often recognize you way down the block, not by, and, and, and you can tell uh, how, which way the wind's blowing, whether or not this works, um, but they can smell you and that's how, they, and they navigate the room the same way. They're just so attuned uh, to senses of smell. Um, and in fact, um, well, never mind, I, I have so many little anecdotes, but I'm gonna save it. Uh, but the point is, is that most mammals, if you think of kangaroos, horses, dogs, cats even, um, are snouted and they have these, they, they navigate the world this way. Well, in the, uh, origin of primates started that shift away from the sense of smell towards the sense of vision. So we navigate the world with our eyes much more than with our nose. To accomplish that, we did a couple of things. First of all, we brought our eyes forward. The vast majority of mammals have their eyes much more on the side, which gives them a wider field of vision, but very poor depth perception. So by bringing the eyes forward, we have that stereoscopic three-dimensional vision where we can get uh, good depth perception. The problem with that is that the snout would be right in the center of, of the field of vision. So what do we do is we regress the snout since we don't need it for, for smell anyway. So we regress the snout into the face. So primates have a much flatter face. Apes have flatter faces even than most primates and humans have the flattest faces of all. So we just basically shove those sinus cavities up in our face to get them out of the way. And that was the easiest thing to do. So they're totally left over and that's why. But here's the thing, even among the apes, we have the worst deal in terms of how our sinus cavities are arranged. So chimpanzees, the drainage pipe is much lower in the maxillary sinuses. It's about halfway up that chamber. So they don't have to work quite as hard. They also spend much more time um, with their head, um, not in what we would consider the vertical position. Uh, and so they're getting more help from gravity. Orangutans ditched, we have, we have uh, several paired uh, chambers, they ditched two of their sinus cavities all together to make more room in their face, and so they have a better arrangement there. Humans really did get the worst end of the deal, and that's why we get uh, congestion, because if this fills up, this chamber fills up with, with dust and allergens, bacteria, um, then drainage slows to a halt, and you get a festering pool of infected mucus, and that's a sinus infection. Um, you can often get, those who get sinus infections can often get temporary relief if they lay down and they get a little bit of help from gravity, but it doesn't cure anything because by that point it's too late. You have that thick, um, very green, very viscous mucus that just doesn't flow. And by the way, the, the, the uh, pipe, the drain pipe there in the, in the maxillary sinus is actually much narrower in humans than it is in other, than other apes. Like I said, we really get the worst end of this deal. Um, and you might wonder, well, why didn't evolution fix this? Well, this is one of those chances to learn one of the harsh realities of, of evolutionary mechanisms. Evolution didn't fix it because you don't die of the common cold very often. You don't take that mutation with you. You don't take that anatomy with you. It's uncomfortable, um, but you generally don't die of, of sinus infections. It doesn't really reduce your reproductive fitness. And so it's an evolution's blind spot. So evolution doesn't um, shape us to be comfortable or healthy or happy. It just shapes us to survive to survive and reproduce. And if you can survive and you can reproduce, 
That's all evolution cares about. Um, that's that's the harsh reality. Okay, so we have sorb. So I talked about the S-shaped uh, spine. I'm, I'm going to skip through this since it's a uh, quick one. Uh, but it leads to those. Uh, and I already covered this. It leads to those slip discs. So if you look at the uh, uh, the backbone, the human backbone here with this S-shaped curve, those weak points in the lumbar is where you get those herniated discs, as you can see in the second. Uh, picture there. If you look at the ACL, which is, so this is a, a picture of the human knee for my book and the patella has been removed. So you, you don't have the kneecaps. So you can see the uh, ligaments. There's most of the, um, the, the holding the upper leg and the lower leg. Most of the, the weight is borne by two uh, ligaments. The ACL uh, is in the front and the ACL uh, really, especially during sudden movements, bears all that weight and it's just not strong enough. So this is that part of that incomplete uh, evolution to upright walking. And I go into more detail in the book about why that is. Okay, so there's anatomy. Um, and, and that's the first chapter of the book. And it seems to be the chapter that most people have written about when they review the book, and uh, which is great. I just hope they made it to the other chapters. <laughs> because I, I mean, that's just chapter one. Pardon me. Okay, so the next chapter is the chapter on the genome. And so I talk about um, all the weird things that are left over in our genome from our past. Um, and a lot of inefficiencies in our genome. And one thing, um, I, I like to throw little tidbits out from this chapter. So for example, um, most people, if they teach biology, might be aware that um, about only about 3% of our DNA uh, is in, in the form of genes. Um, and only about 1.5% of that is actually the coding region of genes. So most of our DNA doesn't code for either protein or RNA. What does it do? Some of it's regulatory, about 20% of it's regulatory, maybe 25% of it's regulatory. But the rest of it, as far as we can tell, really doesn't have any function whatsoever. And there's arguments about how much of the genome has no function. I'm pretty confident to say 75% of the human genome does absolutely nothing for us, or at least nothing good. And the way I get that to that figure is that 75% of the human genome has not been maintained by natural selection, meaning there is no pressure on it to exist in any certain way. Uh, it might be a reservoir for future function, and that's fine, but evolution doesn't really think ahead. Um, that's just getting lucky. Most of the, the human genome has no function whatsoever. And in fact, 9% of the human genome, 9% is viral carcasses from past virus infections that our ancestors um, suffered from and beat. So as you probably know, uh, many viruses actually, as part of their life cycle, incorporate into chromosomes. Uh, in, the, in their host cell. Well, if this was unlucky enough to happen in a, in a gamete, um, you can have part of that viral genome left in the chromosome that gets passed on. And this has happened often enough that 9% of our DNA is actually viral in origin. And so one way to say it is we have, we have more viral genes than human genes because the human genome, the human genes are only about 3%. Um, so you have three times more viral genes than human genes is one way to, to, to think about that. Um, and uh, we also just have a lot of pseudo genes. So I, I give you the example of GULO, which is not functional. It's been littered by mutation, um, but it still looks like a gene. Gene annotation software still finds it. It's like, it's like coming across a, a car in a junkyard. Um, it looks like a car. You can tell it's a car. It probably even has most of the parts of a car, but it can't operate as a car, even a little bit, right? You can't drive it. All, it's, all it has to be missing is one spark plug. I don't know, are spark plugs still a thing in cars? I don't know. But some, at least one essential part's missing from that car. So it can't function, even though it looks like a car. Well, that's that's what the Gulo gene for us. It's a broken gene. It's a pseudo gene, sometimes called dead genes. Well, we don't just have a couple of these. I give example of another one that's, uh, in my mind, even more interesting than Gulo because it, it codes for an immune protein, immune system protein called theta defensin, um, which is probably, if we had a functioning theta defensin, uh, we would have better uh, defenses against retroviruses, which means HIV might not have been the epidemic that it was um, and that it still is. Um, so because uh, we know from uh, the other apes, now chimpanzees also don't have theta defenses, but orangutans do. And the, and the orangutan version of HIV uh, doesn't bother them. It, it is not successful. So it's possible that theta defense, and if we had it, uh, would have protected us against HIV. Um, so, but we don't just have one or two of these pseudogenes. Um, the, the current estimates on the number of pseudogenes that we have is 20,000. 20,000. I've heard estimates up to 40,000. I'm not sure I buy that one. Uh, probably more conservative estimate is 15,000. 
remember, we only have about 20 to 22,000 protein coding genes. So we have almost as many broken genes as, as uh, functioning genes. So if, if, if we use our car analogy, it's like our genome is more like a junkyard than a parking lot, or at least it's a j half junkyard, half parking lot, all mixed in. Uh, so we have a lot of broken genes. We have a lot of viral DNA. We have also a lot of just parasitic DNA, whereas it's, it's DNA that just simply copies itself. It may have originally been virus, although that's probably not the case. Um, we don't know how, how some of them came about. Some of them we absolutely do. There's one um, that's called the alu element uh, that is in our genome. Um, it's about 10% of our genome is this one repetitive DNA. It's, it's there over a million times. It's about uh, 300 base pairs long and we have a million copies of it. It does nothing but copy itself. That's all it does. Uh, so again, more of our genome is alu elements, these copied parasitic DNA uh, than, than genes. So I talk about that in that chapter. Um, I also talk about our diet. So I mentioned uh, the carb diet, uh, but we also just have a lot of needy, uh, we have a needy diet in general. We need vitamin C, for example, but we also need a lot of things that other animals don't need supplemented for them. You know, you got to get vitamin B12, you got to get vitamin D. Uh, these are these are other, uh, in several B vitamins are actually um, known to be dietary insufficiencies that humans have. Um, whereas other animals just don't don't have such a needy requirements. If you think of the, the koala, uh, it, all it eats is eucalyptus leaves, generally. I mean, it can be perfectly healthy eating one type of one plant, uh, you know, leaf. Um, and most animals can have very, very simple diets, can totally thrive, but we can't. We need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, make sure you're getting enough of that, but not too much of this. Why do we have this very demanding dietary needs? Well, part of the reason is that um, in key parts of our evolution, we were the ultimate um, uh, generalists. And so we ate whatever we could find. We were omnivores. So we ate meat uh, when we could find it. When we couldn't, we would, eat, we would scavenge often bone marrow. So we were getting essentially animal products there. We were eating vegetables. We were eating roots, uh, worms, sticks, <laughs> whatever we could find. And we made a diet out of it. Well, once again, uh, it's, it, the lesson from evolution there is if you just serve all this, all these this this nice rich food i mean the rainforest is, is is like living in a salad bowl if you have all of this nice rich food of all different varieties your body loses that functionality to make those nutrients itself uh, through natural selection through the randomness of mutation if you're knocking out genes like gulo and it has no effect because your diet is so rich already um, there'll be no consequence and so the the negative consequences of us having this varied uh, omnivorous generalist diet is that we now need a generalist diet in order to survive and thrive. And so the best way to be healthy is not vitamin supplementation, by the way. I'm not a proponent or a fan of the supplement industry. What I am a proponent of is eating a varied diet. So try to eat nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables every single day. Um, and if you don't eat meat, you don't absolutely need meat to be healthy. It's it, it, in America anyway, in most of the West, it's much easier to be healthy uh, while eating meat, but you don't have to eat meat to be healthy. You just, you do have to worry about how you get your vitamin B12. That's really the only one you have to get from meat. Um, I think seaweed has it as well, kelp. Um, but all you do is get a little vitamin B12 supplement and you're fine. Um, oh, so I already mentioned these. So that's scurvy. That's a drawing of scurvy. Um, and this is talking about vitamin B12. Do we have time? Yeah, it's a quick story. So vitamin B12 is one of the weirdest ones too, because um, vitamin B12, it's also known as co cobalamin, is a strange thing because it's only found in animal products. Um, but yet neither carnivores nor herbivores have any trouble with vitamin B12 deficiency, but humans do. You're like, well, why is this? Well, if you look at the carnivores, they're getting it from their meat. Okay, fine. Where are the herbivores getting it? I mean, all the meat that we eat we, is from animals who themselves are herbivores. So if they're not eating meat, how are they getting vitamin B12? I mean, the cows that you're eating, how, why aren't they dying of vitamin B12 deficiency? Well, it turns out that cows and other herbivores have bacteria in their intestines that make vitamin B12 for them in their large intestine. So that's great. It's like vitamin K. You may have heard that story. Humans uh, have this too. Vitamin K, uh, K is made for us in our large intestine and we absorb it. And that's why many people have never even heard of vitamin K because it's not a dietary vitamin. We get it right in our gut. It's made for us by the bacteria. We absorb it. Vitamin B12 is the same way for all the herbivores. So why don't, why are we so lucky? Why don't we have that bacteria? Or why, maybe we can inoculate ourselves with that bacteria and it would be fine. Well, it turns out we actually do have that bacteria. They live in our large intestine and they make vitamin B12, but we don't absorb it. You know why we don't absorb vitamin B12 in our large intestine? 
we absorb vitamin B12 in our small intestine. So we go to all the trouble of having these bacteria, they make the vitamin B12 for them, and instead of absorbing it, we send it to the toilet. And, and, and you can die of vitamin B12 deficiency while you have it being made for you in your large intestine and you're excreting it uh, as waste. Uh, and in fact, there was a study that was done. Someone's gotta be wondering this. Human feces is a dietarily sufficient source of vitamin B12. Don't recommend it. I don't think you'll find it on the menu anywhere. Hopefully not, hope you don't get that desperate. But we actually make enough vitamin 12 to live on in our large intestine. Uh, but we excrete it rather than absorb it. We only absorb it in our small intestine. Poor design if I've ever heard it. Uh, and why we only express the receptor in uh, the small intestine in the duodenum, uh, sorry, in the ileum is uh, actually a research uh, question in my lab right now. Um, and this is rickets, okay. So if you don't get enough vitamin D, then you won't um, absorb calcium well enough from your diet. And if this happens while your bones are growing, uh, you develop a condition called rickets. And uh, if, if you, have vitamin D deficiency. As an older person, you get a condition called osteoporosis. But the point here is that you need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium, which itself is bad design, right? I mean, why do you need one thing in order to absorb another thing? Vitamin D does other things too, but um, whatever. You don't express what you need to to absorb calcium unless you also get vitamin D, which is why we supplement milk with it and we've largely solved the problem of rickets. However, why do we need vitamin D when most other animals don't? Well, there's a key activation step in, in their diet. There's a key activation step uh, for vitamin D that takes place in the skin. So you have to activate the molecule with UV light, with, with, with uh, UV irradiation, and that activates the, the molecule. Well, uh, most mammals actually uh, do that in their fur. So, um, and that's one of the hallmarks of mammals is that they have fur and they activate vitamin D with their, in their fur. Well, we ditched our fur. It, while we were evolving in the plains, uh, of Africa, of, of sub Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as the rainforest shrunk, we found ourselves in the flatlands, in the grasslands, and uh, we ditched all our hair for a variety of reasons, uh, hypothesized reasons. And so then we have to activate vitamin D in our skin. Okay, that's fine and good, except for UV light on bare skin actually causes cancer. So we developed uh, very dark skin uh, as a way to prevent skin cancer. And that left us with a problem with vitamin D activation. Uh, UV also can, can damage folate. So there's a couple of problems with all this UV light. Um, well, so, but that's fine if you're out in the sun for most of the day and bare skin, as well. but as we migrated away and we get up to upper latitudes, what, ha what happened was um, we were having trouble getting enough UV light because as you go to higher and higher latitudes, you put on clothes. So you're covering uh, your skin and preventing uh, the absorption of of, of UV light, so you're not activating vitamin D. So a lot of cultures uh, were probably, a lot of peoples, excuse me, were, were dealing with vitamin D deficiency in rickets. Um, and so they lightened the skin, lightened the skin in order to absorb as much UV light as they could. Um, one, so, and, and that is why, that is the reason why vitamin D absorption, uh, not skin cancer, it's actually vitamin D absorption, uh, why skin tone among ethnic groups uh, is directly proportional to uh, latitude with one exception, and the exception proves the rule. The one exception are the Inuit peoples of Alaska and Canada. They also, they live at high altitudes while still having uh, dark uh, complexion in their skin. And the reason why is that they eat a diet high in whale blubber and fish oil, which has already activated forms of vitamin D. So that's, I, I, that's the exception that proves the rule. Um, I'm way behind, so I'm gonna have to shoot ahead here. Reproduction. Um, Lots of problems with reproduction in, in human physiology from the age of maturation to the creation of gametes. Um, I know with, with 7 billion of, an, of us on the planet, it's, it's weird to think about uh, poor reproduction as a, as a problem, but actually until quite recently, humans uh, were pretty thin on the ground around the world uh, and had, we still do have somewhat low fertility rates. Um, there's a lot of problems that I talk about in the book. The most famous one, of course, um, is anatomical. So if you look at the shape of the pelvis in chimpanzees, uh, and you and, and if you superimpose the size of a chimpanzee skull at birth, you can see that the chimpanzee skull at birth fits right through uh, a female uh, pelvis just fine. However, what happened as humans began to walk upright, and that was the first step, anatomical step in our evolution was upright walking. Um, we had to sort of narrow the bottom of the pelvis, and we had to put the legs in the bottom rather than towards the side. So if you look at a chimpanzee, their legs flay outwards. And as they walk, they kind of swing their legs around. 
our legs go straight down and that's what gives us that nice striding gait where we don't bounce around with each step. Our center of gravity pretty much stays right in the center as we walk. To do that, your legs have to go straight down. Uh, in fact, they actually go inwards. If you look at it from the out to the inside, your knees are much closer together than your hips. Uh, to accommodate that, however, you'll see we change the shape of the pelvis. And if you look at the uh, an adult human pelvis superimposed with a uh, skull at birth in one of the best examples of a, of a complete skeleton we have, uh, about two and a half million years old, is uh, the Lucy uh, specimen, which is um, Australopithecus afarensis. And you can see that that is just barely fitting through. So the skull had not grown particularly that much from the chimpanzee, but we had the narrowing of the bottom of the pelvis and the legs uh, were brought inward. Well, what happens then, years later, millions of years later, is that the skull grew as well. And so if now if you superimpose a human female, adult human female pelvis with a uh, skull, infant skull at birth, you can see that they, it doesn't fit, basically. And, and so uh, one of the biggest problems with human reproduction is that death in childbirth by both, part, both of the parties involved um, is, is shockingly high. And childbirth is, is a very difficult uh, procedure, I, I've heard, and um, that's unusual. If you look at most mammals, um, childbirth is not terribly difficult for most of them. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can think of examples that of animals that have trouble giving birth, they're all domesticated, which means they've been shaped by our choices rather than uh, natural processes. But generally animals in the wild have no trouble. If you've ever seen a, a giraffe being born and you can find videos or a deer or, or even cows, I saw a cow uh, born on my gran grandpa's farm one time. I mean, they shake themselves off and they're off and running. Uh, as they go and and the mothers are you know, there's a video you can find on YouTube of a gorilla giving birth and She's barely noticing I me. Mean, she's she's eating. She's caring for other children at the same time while she's in labor um, And uh, it really is not a dramatic affair It's really in, in humans a, almost a unique condition that we have this this trouble because of our, our unique evolution uh, Modern medicine has mitigated this quite a bit, but not solved it as you know And in fact maternal mortality is higher in the United States than it is in any other developed country because we have such a poor relationship with childbirth. Um, the, um, the compromise here was obviously big brains are good for evolution, but our hips are narrow. Walking upright is good too. So evolution was sort of pulling on both ends of the rope. So the compromise that was made there was that we're just born too early. Humans are born, a lot of times, the, sometimes people say that the first three months of life are really the fourth trimester. Uh, humans are, are, are born undercooked. <laughs> we really need at least three more months of development. But if you waited that long, childbirth would be impossible. So what and what and the consequence of that is very high infant mortality. Without modern medicine, it, children die uh, in the first year of life very, very frequently. Um, and also uh, children need a great deal of maternal and paternal care. So uh, they're, they're completely incapable. Again, if you look at other animals when they're born, they're often quite capable and can move around and and find their way, but humans really can suckle and cry, and that's about it. Uh, they're, they rely on their parent support for decades, really three or four decades in many cases um, of parental support in order to survive. Uh, and that creates vulnerabilities and it makes infant mortality very, very high. Um, and I think I'm, I have some other examples, but I, I wanna leave time for question. I know I've, I've gone over by a few minutes. So um, I talk about some diseases in the book. Um, you know, all animals get sick. So, so what, how can I say that disease is, an, is a, a human flaw? Well, part of it is, is there are some diseases that we're evolved to have um, that really evolution has almost specifically created these diseases. Um, and I talk about a few of those. Sickle cell anemia is, is, is the most famous one. And so that's the one I have a figure on, but there's other examples in the book. Um, and of course we also have diseases, excuse me, diseases. Well, we have those two, but we have flaws and, and imperfection in our mind, the way our brain works, because our brain was um, it adapted and evolved in a very different world than the one we live in now. So we make poor choices. And there's and I don't just mean we have limits. Everything has limits. I mean that there are some mistakes that we make over and over and over again. Even when we have all the information, when we supposedly learn our lesson, we will continue to make errors in judgment. Um, and these are sometimes called cognitive biases, but they lead to all kinds of very ill effects for society. And our, it was funny, I wrote this book before the 2016 election, 
But after the election, I usually didn't have to do much work to convince people that humans uh, have flaws in our brains um, and, and that this leads to societal consequences. But it's even worse than, than electoral politics. And I talk about that uh, in the book as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time and your patience. I've really um, not enjoyed seeing you, or I, I, I've not enjoyed not seeing you. I wish I could have seen you and interacted, but I'd be happy to take questions now. I'm not gonna stop sharing, but I will maybe minimize the screen. Um, I'm gonna rely on Bertha to get this the way yeah. it well, should be. Should I stop screen sharing now? You probably should, because then we okay. come back up. So you, you've got quite a few questions. Um, oh, great, okay. Well, first of all, there's a comment from Sean Ryan. He says your book is fantastic and he highly recommends it. Ten out of ten. So I thought. Oh, that'd thank be you, thank you. I appreciate that. You're the one. Could you tell my my mother that? She'd appreciate it. <laughs> um, here's a question from Adrian Rodriguez: Would vegans have a vitamin B12 deficiency if they didn't take supplements? Would humans have a vitamin B12? Vegans, vegans. Oh, vegans. Yes, yes. So if a vegan uh, eats absolutely no animal products and doesn't eat seaweed as far as i know seaweed is the only vegan food that has vitamin b12 in it yes so as far as i know unless there's one that i've missed but i've done you know i've looked around and i've talked to vegans um and in fact uh, i was uh, two of my friends are vegans they were they were over here this afternoon uh in a socially distant way um and they they, they say the same thing that they take a vitamin b12 supplement oh, as far as i know there isn't another way to get it but if you eat kelp if you eat like nori or uh you know, those seaweed chips, you, you might be all right there. Yeah, I like those seaweed chips. Yeah, my kids love them. I can't stand them. My kids love them. <laughs> Kristen Griffith asks, if is vitamin D, are the receptors also found in the small intestine of other animals or only in the large intestine? So this um, is your B12, right? Vitamin D. Okay. Oh, no, sorry, um, it's B12, but vitamin okay. D is sun absorption. I think she meant D vitamin D. Yeah, no, because uh, vitamin D also, the receptors are there in the intestines as well because that it's necessary for um, calcium absorption. Anyway, um, so B12, where it's located and where it's expressed in the gut varies a lot among animals. And so uh, if you leave carnivores aside because carnivores don't have, you know, they, it doesn't matter where it is, they'll, they'll absorb it. If you look at herbivores, there's really two types of herbivores when it comes to vitamin B12 absorption, the ruminants and the non-ruminants. Ruminants have an easier time with this because they are passing um, uh, the food back and forth between their mouth and their stomach and their mouth and their stomach. And so their microbiome is much more spread evenly throughout their intestines. And so the bacteria, while it's housed and it, it, its preferential location, you could say, is in the uh, large intestine, they have, they don't, they're not as segregated into small intestine and large intestine as we are. And so the contents get mixed up a lot more. And so uh, enough of the B12 makes it higher up in the digestive system that that's where they absorb it, but they still absorb it in the small intestine. The non-ruminants, this is where it gets a little gross. As far as we can tell, the non-ruminant herbivores, dirt and fecal matter. So from, from as far as we can tell, they don't, they don't absorb it from their large intestine and they obviously don't eat meat by definition they're herbivores and so they're eating enough of pellets and dirt which we assume a lot of that because you got to remember that herbivores of all kinds generate a ton of waste and that waste ends up in the dirt and that's where those herbivores get it the best we can tell okay yes, poprophagia someone just said that's right yeah <laughs> well we lost your your video image but we can hear you fine so okay. we'll just keep Did going I just, oh my camera's still on so uh, Kristen says, thanks so much. That makes sense. So towards the very, very beginning of your talk, one of your attendees named Gabriel Cooley said, quote, evolution is not an expert designer. Evolution is more like a blind drunk man shooting darts, hoping that something sticks. And then uh, another attendee, Oscar, said, I personally dis disagree. If you look into niche construction, you will come to see that we, if we were to reset time, Earth would have the same organisms or similar organisms to the ones we currently have, implying that there's a direction in toward to evolution. That's a great that's a great uh, comment question. And in, in fact, uh, I've actually recently changed my mind on this issue as well. So um, Stephen Jay Gould used to always say, if you rewound the tape and rewound it, you would get totally different organisms. Um, but 
I'm, I'm actually starting to think that some themes would would emerge over and over and over again. Ken, Ken Miller talks about this a little bit in his book uh, from two years ago, but so does, so does Charles Kalkel. A couple of things probably are gonna emerge every time. One is polarization of the body with cephalization and, and nervous system concentration on one end, um, and then a GI flow from this way to that way. Uh, the evolution of limbs. If you look at the things that have come out in multiple lineages, some of these things were bound to happen because they just make so much sense. And um, I, we would have stumbled upon a lot of the, the same solutions to these problems. Um, it's interesting that you bring up niche construction as well, because humans are the ultimate niche constructors, the, the absolute ultimate ones. We completely recreate our environment, every environment that we've, we've gone to. So if you look at what we've spent most of the last six million years, uh, in, in Africa, and most of the last four million years in the grasslands. Um, so we're well adapted to that. But every environment that we went to, into, we were successful, not so much by changing to the environment, but changing the environment to suit us, whether that meant putting on clothes, for example, different tools, hunting different foods. We just, that we took that generalism that we had, and then we just extrapolated across the planet. And so every environment that we've gone into, we've reshaped it to serve our needs. Um, and in fact, often with very negative consequences for that habitat. If you look at the loss of the megafauna throughout the Americas, um, it's as far as we can tell, it was the humans that, that once the humans arrived, um, almost all of the very large animals uh, went extinct. Um, and so, uh, yes, we are ultimate niche constructors. We've solved these problems and it doesn't matter sort of what our limitations were. We would have found ways around them. Um, uh, so it's in terms of a directionality, I mean, I think there are definite trends towards incre increasing complexity, for example. Um, if you look at plants and animals, so those are the only two clades that have evolved complex tissue organization. And they've done it differently. Obviously, animals have much more complex tissues than plants, but they've done it differently. And as far as we can tell, the biggest difference between plants and animals and the other eukaryotes that did not manage to go metazoan with all of these tissue types, uh, we actually think we've found the key thing and it's microRNAs, if you know what those are. MicroRNAs are very small RNA molecules that affect the expression of other genes. And in some cases, thousands of other genes, but usually hundreds of other genes. And these little microRNAs, we think, allowed us to take our genome and essentially double its power or quadruple its power with the same number of genes that you can get infinite more, not infinite, but several orders of magnitude more complexity. And what's interesting about that to me, I know it's a long-winded answer, is that plants and animals evolved that separately. So they landed on, I mean, such a very specific solution. Uh, these little microRNAs that perform this specific function on other messenger RNAs and target them for degradation, blah, blah, blah. It's a, such a specific thing. For it to have emerged twice, once in plants and once in animals, seems incredibly unlikely. But here's the thing. When you have millions of years and trillions of trials, Mm -hmm. unlikely things happen. And when they really make sense, when they really work, they just have to happen once and then <laughs> they take everything else with them. So it's, it's, a, it's a good comment. Uh, another question, let me go to the, I have two more that we should definitely hit. Uh, John Mead asks, you describe ALU as parasitic DNA. What have been the negatives of having such a parasite in our genome? Why has well, ALU been so successful at coping itself? Right, right. So obviously damaging. Yeah, yeah. So Alu, um, like I said, it, it, it's now quieted down. So it's not copying itself anymore. It's not crashing through the genome anymore for the most part. Other transposable elements are, but the ALU element, the Alu element is not is not crashing through. It's it's totally quieted down finally. It, it, it's at least 100 million years old, um, Alu. So what we know is that these elements jump around the genome and they crash into genes. And when they occasionally, and when they do, it's almost always bad. So the alu element specifically has probably led to the death and suffering of millions of individuals, trillions of individuals, maybe, I don't know, over the last 100 million years. Um, so it's almost always bad, almost always bad. But occasionally, very rarely, it does something remarkable. So when the transpo transposable elements jump around from the chromosomes, crashing through randomly, generally doing bad things, Occasionally, they'll pick up a piece of DNA and either move it, and that might not have any effect, or copy it. Because some of these things, the retro transposons make copies of themselves. And so the original one stays there, the transcript gets made, reverse transcribes, and then the copy is what gets moved. 
that's how we have a million copies of ALU. But occasionally when it does that, it grabs a functioning gene and creates a new copy of it. And when you have a second copy of a gene, that's a wonderful recipe for diversification because the original gene or the other, whichever one can hold on to the original function and then the other one can tinker. It, it's free to experiment. And so the reason why primates um, have trichromatic vision, so we have three kinds of cones instead of just two, most mammals have only two, we have three, is because one of those genes was copied in this manner uh, by a transposable element and giving us three copies of the cones, which is, and then of course, what happened, they diverged through mutation. So instead of two co cones trying to color, cover the whole color spectrum, you have three cones covering the color spectrum. So you cover that spectrum much better. So we have better color vision. The primates have better color vision than all of the other mammals. You may have heard that your dog is colorblind. That's not true, but they're dichromatic. They don't see as well as we do with color. We're trichromatic. And actually some females uh, in the population are tetrachromatic because they have mutations in one of the genes that's on the X chromosome. And since they have two copies, they might end up with two different copies. Um, actually two of the genes are on the, the X chromosome. So some females are actually even better at seeing color than, than the rest of the population. So, um, so yeah, so it's almost always bad when these DNA elements jump around the genome, but occasionally something really, really cool happens. And you know what, Kristen Griffith just said something amazing. She said, color vision helps us find fruit to, for vitamin C. Absolutely, that's true. And what that, now the two events weren't tied mechanistically, but it just goes to show that evolution favors the, something happening in the right place at the right time. So how many times did, you know, alu or whatever element copy this gene and it didn't give the animal any advantage and we never knew about it. But when it happened in an animal that was eating fruit, because remember ripening fruit sticks out from the green. Ripening fruit is not green. It's, it's yellow, it's red, it's whatever. So if you can see it better, you can get to the vitamin C. Uh, and it's not just vitamin C, it's also the calories and everything else that comes with the fruit. So those two, two events were not mechanistically tied, but they were tied by evolution because they reinforced one another. It's like the ability to drink milk as an adult. A random mutation happened, and it probably happened millions of times, but if you weren't farming, if you didn't have milk around, it would be no advantage. It has to happen in the right place at the right time. And that's just luck. A lot of good luck got us to this point, and a lot of bad luck doomed countless ancestors. Well, they wouldn't be ancestors, actually. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, I, I asked at least one question per person, so I feel good about that. And I'd like you to comment mm -hmm. on this. I don't know. Morris and Gabriel are going off in the chat. I think they're having a fun time. And one of them said, Morris said, so long story short, humans are a very unlucky species. I don't know if I do. I don't think I agree with that. Well, let me, let me react to that because um, one way I, I put it is we are more flawed than most in our bodies because we don't rely on our bodies to be perfect or to, you know, to, to, to be functional because, so for example, if you didn't, if you couldn't run very fast, probably wouldn't make a good hunter, but you could be a good forager. Um, if you didn't have good vision, maybe you had to do, you do work with your hands. Or maybe you were like a shaman, like a wise person. Uh, and it, there were just so many different ways to contribute when we were living the way that we were living with these big brains and big groups. Um, and so I think that's a happy story, right? Because it means that you don't have to be perfect. As long as you can contribute something in some way, you don't have to be all things to all people. You just have to have something of value. And um, here, here, here's another reason why I think it's uplifting. There's a, a fossil that's my, one of my favorite fossils. It's called the Old Man of Demonisi. So it's, a, it's two and a half million years old, Homo erectus fossil. And this, this guy was probably 70, 80 years old and he's missing all his teeth and the bone has completely healed over. So he has no teeth for at least two years. How does somebody, this is before fire was controlled. <laughs> yeah, this is before fire was controlled. How does somebody survive on the foods they ate for two years with no teeth? Somebody was preparing and cooking, not cooking, but preparing and probably chewing his food for him. Someone was chewing his food for him, which means that his value to the group was recognized enough right. that they would take care of him. Um, and so I think that that's our story. We've been taking care of our elders, for example, for a long time because they knew things <laughs> that they could teach and, and so on. So I think it's a happy story. The fact that our bodies are flawed just shows that we rely on each other and rely on our ingenuity uh, to survive rather than, than our physical prowess. 
Wow, that's a, I think that's a perfect place to end. This has been a really, really good talk. I've heard this talk before, and I still learn something new. <laughs> I try to change the examples for you, Bertha. <laughs> Thank you. I really, I really, really appreciate that. Dr. Lentz is such a great supporter of ties. He's even he's flown in one day from New York to Florida, presented in person, and flown back to New York. How um, you and so I, I appreciate him probably more than any other scientist that I've worked with here in ties. Um, I want to let people know that. For, uh, thank you, Kenny. You let people know that there's a bunch of webinars coming up. We're trying to help teachers, you know, as much as we can as we go online. I just linked a Crowdcast uh, registration there to all about dogs. The author of the, of the book called Dog is Love, and I think that would be a great one. And um, John linked to the old man of the Manishi, and Kenny Coogan linked to our website where we have several. Our next one's coming up is the history of the creationist evolution battle in Florida. That's coming up Thursday night. Oh, that's, um, uh, what, yeah. I met him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be a great time. Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, especially Dr. Lentz. I want you to close it off for us so you can have the last goodbye. All right. Well, uh, take heart. I know these are crazy, strange times. I'm in the same boat as you are, moving my classes to all online and hating it. Uh, and also trying to homeschool my own kids, which has been interesting. Um, so, uh, but here we go. It's humans with a challenge that nature brought to us, essentially, you know, essentially, I mean, part of it's our, the way we're living, but, um, and we're solving the problems with ingenuity. So it's a good thing that just being good against viruses isn't what's necessary. Does that actually, we can take social action, talk to each other, take heart, get advice, learn things, and that's how we're going to solve this problem. We've been doing this for millions of years. We'll solve this problem, too. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Bye. It was a lot of fun.